Okay, we are live, everyone. It's Michael Shermer for The Michael Shermer Show. My guest today is the great Seth Stevens Davidovitz, and his new book is Don't Trust Your Gut, Using Data to Get What You Really Want in Life. Seth is a contributing op-ed writer for the New York Times, a lecturer at the Wharton School, and a former Google data scientist. He received a BA from Stanford and a PhD from Harvard. His research has appeared in the Journal of Public Economics and other prestigious publications. His previous book, Everybody Lies, was a New York Times bestseller and an Economist Book of the Year. He lives in Brooklyn and is a passionate fan of, I'm sorry to say, the Mets, Knicks, Jets, and Leonard Cohen. The Leonard no, Mets are good now. <laughs> the Leonard Cohen is fine, uh, but I'm a Lakers fan and a Rams fan, you know, Dodger fan. Yeah, I guess we're uh, okay, uh, we're, geog- okay. we're we're geographically <laughs> tribal species. <laughs> so um, yeah, I love the new book. I listened to the whole thing, and I just went through the actual physical book because you have a lot of charts and graphs in there that I didn't see when I was just yeah. just listening to it, which is interesting. I wanted to just kind of just give a little background to your previous book as I seg into this one because this is something of a sequel, uh, and I wrote about everybody lies in Scientific American. So let me just read what I wrote, and then you can kind of give us an update uh, about what uh, what you think some of these, um, uh, you know, polling data compared to search data shows. So, for example, I was interested in, as you know, uh, moral progress, and and so I was disturbed to find some of the data that you found uh, in the 2008 presidential election, in which uh, 20. Let's see. Um, uh, that you concluded that Barack Obama received fewer votes than expected in Democrat. Uh, strongholds because of still latent racism. For example, he found you that 20% of searches included the word the N word, also included the words jokes, and that on Obama's first election night, about one in 100 Google searches with Obama in them included KKK or N word. And then quoting you, in some states, there were more searches for N word president than first black president and not predominantly from Southern Republican bastions, as one might predict, but from upstate New York, Western Pennsylvania, Eastern Ohio, and industrial Michigan, and rural Illinois. This difference between public polls and private thoughts, Stevens Davidovitz concludes, helps explain Obama's underperformance in these regions and partly illuminates the surprise election of Donald Trump. So that was 2018. Here we are four years later. Um... What do you think about what your conclusions were then compared to what they were, say, in the 2020, what they would have been, say, 2020 election and in, in, in the coming couple of years? Yeah, I mean, I don't think, uh, I think if anything, that, that idea has kind of been justified. You know, when I first started writing about racism and using Google searches to measure racism, uh, literally I sent my first paper uh, claiming that there was a secret racism that could be uncovered with Google searches to journals. And it was rejected because nobody believed it. Uh, because if you remember that in back in that period, there was this idea we lived in a post-racial society and uh, that th- that explicit racism, all, all focus on racism at that point, or mo- 90% of the focus on racism was on implicit racism. So you, me, everybody listening uh, has these subconscious associations between races and certain uh, traits of people, although I know uh, Jesse Single, I think has been a guest of your show, uh, thinks that that test is all a bunch of bunk. Uh, well, not, but, not just him. He's reporting uh, what other scientists have said. Yeah, he's reporting yeah, yeah. from other people who say the same. But uh, there was this idea that, you know, that Americans, uh, people thought it was shocking that the, the, when, I, when I did the study on N-word, uh, basically N-word searches, N-word jokes, uh, the referees, I said that this was 7 million searches in, the, in that year that I was analyzing. And the referees for the paper thought that they kind of glanced over that and they're like, this must be a fringe search. We're talking about, you know, j- drawing conclusions from hundreds of people, but it was 7 million searches. Uh, and I think now there is more of an idea that uh, that racism is an issue. Although, to be honest, racism and Steven Pinker has shown this uh, racist searches have gone down over time. So I think now the, there is more of an idea that explicit racism exists in the United States, wh- thanks to Donald Trump's election and some other events. Uh, but I think actual racism, if anything, has gone down. Uh, it's just that we're more aware of it. It's become maybe more public. Uh, and nobody now takes seriously the idea that America is a post-racial society. Uh, so I think the, 
the general idea from that uh, study has been, you know, has been largely borne itself out. Uh, when I did the study, I created this map of racism and uh, it was to study the effects on Obama and Nate Cohn of the New York Times. He said, you have this map of racism. I have this data on support for Donald Trump. Let's put them together. And the map wasn't created with any idea. Donald Trump wasn't really in the political scene at that time. And he found that it was the strongest predictor of support for Trump that he could find uh, higher than demographics or exposure to trade or various economic variables, political attitudes. Uh, it's, it's interesting. The racism map is kind of surprising because uh, we usually think of racism as being predominantly a Southern issue. So if you think of America's history, uh, racism, civil war, North versus South, Jim Crow laws, South, uh, we kind of divide America into two with the North being considered not racist and the South being uh, considered racist. And as you mentioned, your scientific American piece, uh, the Google searches, and I, there's been some other studies with Twitter data showing similar things uh, that we now America could be divided much more east versus west on race, the racism front, uh, where it's much higher in the eastern part of the United States, including Pennsylvania, Ohio, parts of upstate New York, West Virginia, uh, Kentucky, uh, but lower parts of Michigan, but much lower in the western part of the United States. Uh, even when, when I did the paper, I think Utah was either the lowest state or the second lowest state for racism, uh, which people found surprising uh, because there, there's been some you know, checkered past in Utah around racism, but uh, that's borne out in different data sets uh, that uh, Utah is very, very low in racism. Uh, now, almost any way you look at the data and uh, other Western states similarly score very, very low in racism. Yeah, here's what um, Pinker wrote in Enlightenment Now, which was 2018. Um, a, uh, let's see, a Google Trends search for and were jokes, bitch jokes, and bag jokes between 2004 and 2017, conducted by Steven Pinker and reported in his 2018 book, Enlightenment Now, showed downward plummeting lines of frequency of searches as a percentage of the peak month indexed to 100 for each search term, from 80% yeah. to 10% for racist jokes, from 60% to 18% for sexist jokes, and from 51% to 3% for homophobic jokes. Quoting Pinker, the curve suggests that Americans are not just more abashed about confessing to prejudices than they used to be. They privately don't find it as amusing, close quote. More optimistically, these declines in prejudice may be an underestimate, given that when Google began keeping search records of searches in 2004, most Googlers were urban and young who are known to be less prejudiced and bigoted than rural and older people who adopted the search technology years later when the bigoted search lines are in steep decline. Stevens Davidovitz confirms that such intolerant searches are clustered in regions with older and less educated populations, and that compared to national searches, those from retirement neighborhoods are seven times as likely to include N-word jokes and 30 times as likely to contain fag jokes. Additionally, he found that someone who searches for N-word is also more likely to search for older generation topics, such as Social Security and Frank Sinatra. I remember laughing when I read that. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah he he those are all his, his ideas he's a total creative uh genius type and he i i had done all this research on racist searches and i'm such a pessimist that it never even occurred to me to consider this optimistic angle and then uh steven pinker emailed me with this He's like, have you noticed that the, this data you've analyzed that all these searches have plummeted over time I'm like, oh yeah, that's never even uh, crossed my mind. And then he came up with that idea to, I think, you search for, uh, see if it correlates with things like Frank Sinatra. <laughs> and uh, it, it, it's totally true, uh, totally borne out in the data, any way you look at it, uh, that the searches have gone down. And I think that is more evidence of uh, the improvement in society, uh, even if uh, we're more aware of uh, racism because of some of these tools and because of, unfortunately, Donald Trump, uh, who made, made I think, you know, and, and some other events. Uh, I did this article when I was working on Everybody Lies. I did this article on this site Stormfront, this hate site. And uh, 
this is one of the more interesting ideas where I came to an idea for an article. I Googled myself uh, and <laughs> they, I saw that they quoted you. <laughs> I was being talked about Seth Stevens Vivitz on the site Stormfront. I'm like, oh, awesome. Someone's <laughs> discussing my research. And then I go and I mean, if you look at my last name, it's <laughs> yeah. yeah. Everybody knows I'm Jewish. Right. It was, they were not happy with me. <laughs> uh, it was just Jew, Jew, Jew thinks that the whole society's racist. And I go, but, but the thing that struck me about that, the messages discussing me were that uh, they were very smart. They were, I, 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 I'm, I'm, they were, they hated Jewish people. They hated people with the last name Davidowitz. They hated New York Times writers. They hated people who thought racism was a big problem in the United States. But they knew tons about politics, philosophy. They read everything. Uh, so I wrote an article about this group of Americans that uh, was really, really educated, really, really smart, and uh, was pr- and was uh, filled with hate with most of the focus on Jewish people who they viewed as the clever force behind some of the changes they didn't like in society. And I wrote that article in the New York Times. I found out years later, my dad told my mom that Seth has gone completely crazy. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, that he's talking about neo... What the, what's he talking about? Neo-Nazis now in the United States and Stormfront and anti-Semitism. Seth has lost his mind down c- conspiracy theories and rabbit holes. And then my dad finally, when the Charlottesville protests happened and there were all these anti-Semites uh, with their tiki torches, uh, my dad told my mom, I guess Seth was right all along, uh, which I think shows the power of some of these tools like Google searches or Stormfront or web or other internet data where you can actually find trends uh, before the world realizes them and even be seen as crazy, uh, but uh, be right. Uh, you know, I knew from the data, I said, well, they're just, this is the most popular hate sign in the United States. It's predominantly fo- focused on Jews. So this is clearly something happening underground in the United States. And I wrote that article not knowing that my dad had thought that it, I had gone insane uh, as a conspiracy theorist. Uh, it, was, it was interesting. It, sh- it shows the power of data, I think. Yeah. Well, even that phrase, it's gone underground, it's it, it, the, it, the reason is because the norms have shifted. That's no longer okay. I mean, if you go back a century ago, uh, they didn't, no one attempted to hide those kind of prejudices. It was just kind of commonly known. It's, it's like the line I make about Holocaust denial. In previous centuries or millennium, no one had to deny genocide because everybody knew they did it. As long as it didn't happen to you, <laughs> what's the problem, <laughs> right? So um, that that's a sign of progress, I think. And another way to think about these, that I way I think about it is, uh, Richard Dawkins' concept uh, that he calls the the tyranny of the discontinuous mind, that is binary thinking. So if you say, well, we now Obama's been elected president, we're now in a post racial society, so racism it has to be down to zero. And then the moment something happens, like the crazy uh, uh, Buffalo shooters, like oh, okay, so or the George Floyd killing or whatever, okay, so things are just as bad as they've ever been. Well, no, <laughs> you can have a lot of progress and it's going way down and still. There's enough to fill the evening news because there's always going to be nut jobs and deranged people or ideologues like the shooter. I was just writing this morning about uh, his manifesto, which I got a copy of manifesto. I call it a screed. Manifesto is too noble a word for for his document. Uh, so there's clearly people that believe the great replacement theory and the whites are being outbred by the, by brown people and and so on. Uh, but there's fewer of them than there used to be. Right. So there's still progress. And there's still uh, issues to be dealt with. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I, although I think there one complication with that is that the internet does allow these people to congregate in ways that they haven't been able to congregate in a while. So uh, you know, I do, I do think that something like anti-Semitism or white replacement theory, because the norms have changed so much, it would have been hard for people to discuss to come to those ideas. And uh, I think now, uh, due to the internet, uh, sites like Stormfront exist and uh, people are finding each other uh, in ways they didn't previously. Although I do agree also, I I do agree that the trends are positive. There's a little complication in the positivity that uh, that probably there are more people aware, there are probably more people 
talking about replacement theory with group with large groups of people who agree with them than there were before Stormfront was widely widely yeah. available uh, on the internet. Yeah. So since you worked at Google, let's just focus on that for a second. That is a problem. No, no question about it. The polarization, the bubbles, the social media issues that have come up in the last four years. Should we regulate social media? Should we break up the big tech companies? They have too much power. You know, what's the solution to the problem? We agree that there's a problem. How do you think about that? Well, it's interesting. I talk about in Everybody Lies, some of the research that shows that uh, pol- that we're less polarized uh, online than offline. Uh, there's great work by Matt Genskow and Jesse Shapiro who have shown that if you actually look on online, there's the chances that you come across someone with opposing viewpoints is higher online than offline because offline we're incredibly segregated. Uh, we tend to live in these zip codes where you know a large majority of people support, uh, support have the same views as us and then we join clubs with people share our views and uh, so I think there's a little bit of a misconception that the internet is maybe making this problem worse I'm not totally sure it's true it's a site like Facebook or even Twitter we tend to be exposed to different views uh, that's one of the reasons that it's such an aggravating site for many people is we actually are seeing other people's views there's so many uh Democrats were following Donald Trump and following Donald Trump supporters and getting in arguments with them. So I don't totally know that the bubble is the problem with uh, social media. I think there are other problems, like the fact that it seems to legitimately make people unhappy, uh, which I talk about in my new book, uh, that there's pretty convincing evidence, randomized controlled trials. And when you pay people to stop using Facebook, or there's even a study since then, pay people to stop using TikTok or Twitter, uh, they do report uh, lower levels of depression, uh, greater subjective well-being. Uh, so that's maybe, if I had to say the bigger problem with social media, it may be the, that it legitimately makes us unhappy for the obvious reason that uh, we're compared, our happiness tends to uh, depend on how we compare ourselves, think of our place in the world and social media have all these people showing off and pretending their lives are so great. It makes us feel lousy. Yeah, for sure. I even experience uh, a little bit of uh, FOMO, fear of missing out. Uh, even at my age, at 67, you know, when I see uh, Steven Pinker or Richard Dawkins or, or Dan Dennett, they won some award or they get invited to some conference. They're they're good friends. I'm happy for them. But moments later, I think, wait a minute, how come I wasn't invited? <laughs> you know, now, wait a minute, I'm being left out here. This is not cool, right? So I get that. And, and I can only imagine if I was 20, I'd probably be driving myself crazy thinking about that kind of stuff. Uh, but yeah, so good. I'm glad to hear that, uh, those some of those new studies. I do wonder if, it, if it's just a market economic uh, phenomenon of the um, kind of like the QWERTY effect, you know, the path dependency, the first people in got, you know, 90% of the audience and a, a kind of libertarian market solution. Well, just start, you know, have Peter Thiel start his own Twitter and they can compete and then the marketplace will settle it out and there'll be two or three of them and, and that'll take care of the problem. But no one seems to be able to do that. Yeah, that's true. Although there has been, I mean, TikTok kind of came out of nowhere. Mm. Uh, that's that, true. That's a recent phenomenon. Everyone thought Facebook had won social media or YouTube had won video and mm. now we're seeing TikTok dominating them. So I'm not totally sure that the current winners are going to be the ultimate winners in the social media game. If you actually look, there have been charts that have gone viral, the popularity of different social media sites over time. They tend to go like this, uh, except the one exception is Reddit, which just seems to keep on growing uh, for reasons nobody fully understands. But uh, lots of the other ones have kind of gone up and down. Facebook's already using losing users. Uh, so I, yeah, I don't know. I think I think we could have. I, I'm, I'm not convinced that there can't be a new social yeah, media yeah. platform that I would like to think so. Different. Could be there's a recency People. effect and that if we had this conversation 10 years from now, we'd laugh at ourselves for thinking the equivalent of talking about MySpace, you know, like, <laughs> why were you worried about MySpace? They're gone. <laughs> that's what, that's the way it goes. Right. Um, yeah. You know, it's just like people yeah, in the fifties sure. and sixties in the state department worried about IBM and general motors are too big uh, or, or, you know, Microsoft in the nineties, we got to break them up. You know, that's a monopoly. And then now no one talks about that. It's like things just move on. So, yeah, it could be if this is only a, a temporary problem. Well, 
Uh, I love the new book, Don't Trust Your Gut. Uh, I thought you could have also titled it um, uh, Moneyball Your Life, which you use for one of your subheads in there because <laughs> this is one of my favorite yeah, all-time yeah. movies, uh, Moneyball. And so we could, we could talk sports a little bit, but the, but the larger application is what is the point of your book uh, to general life. That yeah, yeah. One of my favorite scenes in that movie is where uh, the Brad Pitt character is, is in with the, all the scouts and they're talking about some of the players that they want to – uh, get rid of or bring on it. And, and one of the old scouts using his, in his gut saying, well, you know, this batter, uh, have you seen his girlfriend? She's not very good looking. And the other the guys are like, Oh yeah, she's not a looker at all. So that must mean his confidence is very low. So that's why he's having trouble hitting. <laughs> it's like, this is the lamest argument anyone could come up with. Right. Yeah, for sure. And that's kind of, so the, I always say, people say what motivated you write to this book. And I don't know if you feel the same way with your writing, but usually there are about 10 motivations that come together and it's never, there was one reason you wrote this book and uh, there, there, there are plenty of different reasons, but uh, definitely one of the bigger, one of the big motivations is I am such a big baseball fan and I am, I loved uh, both the book and the movie Moneyball. And as baseball fans, we just noticed the game is so different uh, than it was, you know, when I was a boy, I was a huge Mets fan and, the infield shift was something you did very, very rarely. It was like a radical thing to do. And then you turn on games now, they're going to ban it. But, uh, you know, over the years, the infield shift just became commonplace and bunting and stealing. People stopped doing that. And there have been so many changes in the game and they've just been successful. So the A's were successful doing it. Then the Rays became even more successful doing it. And uh, at some point you look at the top teams in Major League Baseball and they're all the best the most money ball is the money ball teams. You know, the Astros got really into money ball and they became great. The Yankees for a while become even, and the Dodgers became more into money ball and they started becoming even better. Uh, so, so it kind of occurred to me that it's proven so successful in baseball. Could you use some of these principles in your own life? Uh, which I think I, I, I would argue none of us really do. So if we decide, you know, how should I date? Whom should I marry? Uh, how should I spend my time? What job should I choose? Does anybody really analyze? Does anybody, I mean, some people do, but I would say very few people really do a data deep dive into these questions. We kind of just do what feels about right. Uh, we're not that different from the scout you talk about in Moneyball. Just say, hey, yeah, I heard something, uh, you know, that, that, that sounds plausible. Uh, so what, and, and so what would data say? So I spent... Uh, the better part of four years, uh, just reading studies, uh, you know, I, I, by, by other researchers, uh, on these topics, these big topics, I've kind of a chapter on, uh, kind of what I consider the major areas of life. Uh, you know, the, the, I, I'm, it's not comprehensive. I don't, I don't have a chapter on, uh, physical health and fitness, uh, because I, I wasn't that interested in it, so I figured I'd just get bored and uh, kind of cut. You know, it's an obvious area a gap in the in the book that's supposed to cover all the areas of life, but uh, I just did it. You know, deep dive data. And what I found when I was doing this is we're living in an age where we can actually give ants. We could start to you take a money ball approach to life. So, uh, so for example, my favorite study is the theme of the last chapter is this project that I hadn't heard of. I don't know if you had this uh, mappiness project uh, by George McCarran and Susanna Murado. Uh And I know, uh, Michael, you've emailed me already that you have uh, some skepticism about this project, which I'm sure we'll get into, which is fair. Uh, but they ping people on their iPhones and they ask them, uh, who are you with? What are you doing? And how happy are you? Zero to 100. And they found all these really, really neat patterns. They, they built a data set of 3 million happiness points, which is just way bigger than everything that came before. And they could do these advanced studies of the type of Moneyball. You know, the, the, the thing that made Moneyball possible was there's just so much data on baseball. So baseball fans are such nerds. Uh, you know, I was drawn to baseball as a kid because I was a nerd. And we just loved box scores and play-by-plays and collecting all this data. But when I was growing up in the 1990s, there weren't play by plays on people's happiness. You know, oh, th these people did this on the, this given day and they were this happy. 
we're starting to get to the point where that exists. Uh, thanks to projects like Mappiness. There are some other ones. There's Track Your Happiness. There's Happy Air. But I think Mappiness is kind of the most, uh, the best and the most groundbreaking. And uh, they started uh, noticing all these patterns in what makes people happy that legitimately have changed uh, how I view, how I how I live my life, uh, knowing these uh, these this happiness uh, research. So. I think uh, like a, an example, Moneyball, use the health example. I, I don't think you needed a chapter. The book doesn't is not missing it at all because we all know that doctors base a lot of their decisions and recommendations on family history and general epidemiological studies. So they'll tell you, Seth, don't smoke and you should exercise, you know, half an hour a day, six days a week and do this and do that and so forth. Now, you personally, maybe you could smoke and, and live to be 95, but on average, this is what the data shows, right? And that's what you should do. And if you have a family history of heart disease or or whatever, then here are some additional steps you could take and take a statin for cholesterol, whatever. And uh, so that would be an example. And, and it, you don't have to personally do it, but just if this is the goal you want and you have these parameters, then this is probably what you should do on average. Yeah, there's this whole community that are also... I interviewed a bunch of people in this community and then I didn't write a chapter on it because for a variety of reasons, but it's super interesting. The quantified self community where they're trying to learn more about their own particular health by tracking you know, their day to day blood pressure much more frequently than a doctor would and uh, tracking their mood more frequently and, tra and learning things about themselves uh, that uh, allow them to escape these averages and learn what really influences their, you know, tracking their food intake and what, uh, how their uh, glucose um, changes when they, when they eat different foods and some foods, it, there seems to be evidence that there's a lot of variation in uh, what works for different people, how in, in di what diets work for different people. And some people, bananas are really good for them. Some people, bananas are actually bad for them. Uh, so it's a very interesting area that I think we're going to, that, that's gonna, another area that may explode in the next uh, five to 10 years, uh, personalized uh, health. But uh, I didn't, the reason I didn't include that is my book's kind of meant for lazy people in many ways. It's trying to find like these, it's trying to find these hacks that, you know, don't worry about 80, you, you're going to face 10,000 parenting decisions. Most of them don't matter. Just pick a good neighborhood and here's how to do it. It's very simple, easy advice. Uh, because I consider myself a very lazy person. And when I was interviewing the quantified self community, I just felt like uh, it was a lot of work. Like I got to get this glucose monitor and track my foods every day. I was doing all these things that to me seemed like a lot of energy. And I kind of would give up. And if I'm like, if I'm giving up on this, then my readers are probably going to give up on it too. So I'll just offer them some very, very easy uh, solutions to life problems, uh, which, which I think data can now help us with these tricks that have been hidden uh, from us uh, until the data's uncovered them. I think a lot of it has to do with what your goal is. What is it you, you want to achieve as a parent or as a husband or wife or as an employee or career seeker? Uh, like in the Moneyball example, back to sports, and, and maybe you could just explain a little bit what that is for people not, not familiar with it. But uh, what's the goal? Is it to win as many games as possible? Is it to fill as many seats as possible? So if you spend a lot of money on a big home run hitter, he's probably not going to get you a uh, hundred wins for the season, which would be really good. But maybe he puts a lot of butts in the seats and the, and the owner makes more money, right? So d does it not, at least to a certain extent, depend on what the goal is? Yeah, that's a great example. Though, ideally, if the market's inefficient enough, you can find tricks to reach all your goals. Uh, so if you, you know, you figure out that uh, Kevin Euclid is just massively undervalued, as I talk about in the book, he was, uh, and he's, you know, he, he ends up hitting plenty of home runs and had a great personality, and uh, also he kind of hit all the all the sweet spots. Boston loved him, and he made the team better, and he was undervalued. So if the market's inefficient enough, you can maybe, uh, you, you can maybe don't have to sacrifice. But sometimes, yeah, for sure, uh, there are sacrifices. I think the happiness section is a great example. I know you were critical 
I conclude the happiness section with what, all, all, what is the data-driven answer to life? And if you put together all the different studies on, uh, mostly the mappiness su uh, study, because I think it was the best, uh, the data-driven answer to life is uh, be with your love on an 80 degree and sunny day, overlooking a beautiful body of water, having sex. <laughs> yeah, uh, like that maximizes. You said it perfectly. Ha <laughs> That's right. Happiness. I was going to read it. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. And that, that maximizes happiness. But I think you were rightly pointing out that is that the goal of life to lie on the beach having sex, uh, you know, to be near <laughs> right. on a beach vacation, right. you know, having sex uh, is is that there are, there are more goals to life than yeah. just moment to moment pleasure. And even that might get old after a while that may wear off. Uh, but I think you definitely, it, I, I'm not, to, to be clear, I'm not literally recommending based on the studies that, everybody just immediately quit their job and move to the beach and become a hedonist and have tons of sex. But I think you should keep in mind these charts and just how do they differ based compared to what you expected and make slight adjustments based on that. So the fact that, for example, there's very convincing evidence on the happiness boost from being in nature, particularly near bodies of water. And you don't have to, from that study, say, okay, now I'm going to move to the woods or move and buy a, I'm going to move to a lake. Uh, and that's, you know, there are other considerations that come into play uh, in deciding where you live and how you spend your time. But would anybody be wise to spend, who, would anybody who spends very little time in nature be wise to keep these studies in mind and spend a little more time in, in nature, a little more time walking by a lake? a little more time on the beach, I think, yes. Uh, and I certainly have in my life uh, where I've taken a couple beach vacations. I used to, all my vacations were to other cities. Uh, I thought it was such an urban night and now I take trips to nature by the, by the water, go to lakes more. Uh, I take a walk by the river now instead of on a busy street in Brooklyn. Uh, so I, I do make, make these little adjustments. Uh, even if I don't, I'm, I'm not literally trying to spend every moment doing the things that make people give people the most happiness in the moment, but I am uh, making adjustments in how I live my life based on this, I think, very credible research on what gives people the most, at least in the moment, happiness. Yeah, I, I don't doubt the research. The research is good and, and it's uh, come a long ways from psychology in the you know, last century or so, which mostly focused on negative things, depression and anxiety and human violence and things like that. So it was good that the positive psychology movement happened in the 90s. And let me come back to that point in just a bit, but just to focus on the money ball thing. So one of my favorite quotes from Thomas Sowell is, there are no solutions, there's just trade-offs or compromises, right? So in baseball, you have a cap on how much money you could spend, your payroll cap, right? I guess the league must set that or whatever. And the Yankees and Dodgers are up by the, the ceiling and, and the small uh, town, small city, uh, franchises have less money and so on. So the point of Moneyball is, you know, how can we utilize the, you know, the, the money we have in the most efficient way, whereas maybe the Dodgers and Yankees can afford to buy some bigger brand names or something like that. So it's all compromise. And so if I have, here's my current salary. Okay. Given what I have, where can I live? And you know, what, where can I send my kid to school? What kind of food can I buy? How many trips can I take a year? How many days can I spend walking barefoot at the beach? And all the things that I know are good, but, you know, I can't do that all the time. As you said, you can't recommend people quit their jobs. They got to pay their bills, right? So given that I have to pay my bills and I got to go to this, this job, can I at least find a job that's not miserable and maybe one that's even fun? And, and then, you know, here's some of the things I could do to find uh, somebody that I could uh, marry. I have a lifelong partner that I'm in love with. So, he, so for that, I want to know if that's my goal. Okay, if I'm going to go to a dating site, what should I put on my, my my screen? You know, what in my whatever they call it, your profile, right? What what kind of picture should I use? How much should I talk about what I am like versus what I'm looking for? Right? Aren't there studies on that about what percentage you should talk about yourself versus what you're looking for, and on and on and on. For there, you know, you have to have the data because your gut is probably going to give you the wrong um, uh, the wrong answers. Yeah, they and they've done studies. I talk about this one in Every Lies where they 
on speed dates. Is the sound okay? I'm yeah. not too loud, am I? Yeah, no, no, sounds good. It's okay? Okay. Uh, they've measured they've measured the text of people on on uh, they, they've uh, recorded what people say on speed dates and the end of the date they say, do you want to go on a, on another date? And they found that what predicts what t- uh, t- words and tone predict uh, what makes people more likely to want a second date. And uh, one of the biggest predictor for both a man and a, a man and a woman in heterosexual dating to go want to go on a second date is the woman using the word I. Uh, the more the woman talks on the first date about herself, the more both people will want to go on a second date. Uh, so I think that's a, a money ball advice that many men can uh use i think men heterosexual men their instinct on a first date certainly my instinct on a first date uh, in my 20s was to show off and talk about myself and try to brag and i think uh listening and asking questions is much more likely to lead to uh a second date uh there's also a, a really fun study by uh, Christian Rudder of OK Cupid, where he measured what makes you mo- most attractive to people in uh, online dating, and you know, used millions of preferences to study this, and he found that the most successful daters uh, in uh, online dating are exactly who you'd expect. You know, think of like Brad Pitt or Natalie Portman, the most beautiful people in the world. Uh, but then he found the next most successful group of daters were people that had some sort of extreme look. So think of heterosexual women who shave their head or dye, or men or women who dye their hair pink or blue or wear crazy glasses or have crazy outfits. And the key is they're polarizing, which actually is good in dating and also probably in business. And you kind of know this. Uh, you're probably more successful as a rabid atheist than you would be as an agnostic. <laughs> <laughs> right uh, Maybe. Or, you know, like, <laughs> yeah there's 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 a sense in which you want to really lean into an extreme uh an extreme version of yourself to get that that'll piss a lot of people off there are, you know the i'm sure there are, i'm sure you have many many people who are not happy with your views on religion and other topics uh but it doesn't really matter uh, it's better than being met to everybody. And that's true in dating where uh, you don't want everyone to think you're okay. You're fine. You want some people to think you're exactly what I'm looking for. And to do that, you frequently have to do something extreme to kind of grab their attention, be an extreme version of yourself. Uh, which I always say is how, uh, I think maybe based on uh, Christian Rudder's finding, I kind of d- did that in my own life because uh, I, I don't think it's going to surprise anybody that I can come across as extremely nerdy. Uh, <laughs> and when you're extremely nerdy, when you're when you're extremely nerdy and single, people are going to give you advice, and most of the advice is stop being so nerdy. Uh, you know, like learn how to dress like a normal human being, and uh, Stop talking about charts and tables and graphs and learn to talk about things that, you know, as heterosexual that other women are interested in, maybe fashion or uh, other other topics. And, you know, I, I don't know if you saw the movie Bor- Borat, but of course, uh, Borat, I think, goes. Yeah, he goes to get coaching on how to date. <laughs> right. And the coaching is always how to be the most mad person ever. You know, ask her, you know, like uh tell her about your hobbies and ask her what her hobbies are and just be very conventional, safe. And I think what the research suggests, the data suggests is that's the worst approach because you're just going to get, again, unless you're spectacular looking where everybody wants to date you no matter what your personality, you're just going to, everyone's going to be like, yeah, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine, but they're not going to be totally into you. And so my advice to nerds in dating is nerd it up. (laughs) <laughs> just go all in on being nerdy and it's it's the same whatever you are go all in atheist you're go all in on being an atheist go all in on whatever it is about you that you know if if you on a dating site say that you're 
into statistics and math and nerdiness and have a nerdy profile, huge percent of people are going to say no and probably be, they might even tell their friends, you're never going to believe this weird person I encountered uh, on this dating site. But some people are going to be really into it. My girlfriend was, uh, we've been dating almost two years, actually more than two years. And she had 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 a conversation before I met with her female friends or girlfriends. And they were talking, what's your type? What's your type? And they were going around and people were saying tall, dark, and handsome, uh, you know, firefighter, whatever. And her type, she goes, I like nerds. Ooh. That was her type. She liked <laughs> nerds. Perfect. And then if I had just not been an extreme version of who I am, which is very nerdy, I wouldn't have won her over. And, you know, on our first date, uh, it was on a rooftop during COVID. She brought a bowl of cherries uh, for our date. And I saw the bowl of cherries and Amelia had an idea that I juggle the cherries because I actually am a juggler. So I, 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 I got three of the cherries. <laughs> I, I'm not joking. This is 100% true. I started juggling the cherries. And then, yeah, at the end, I threw one of the cherries high in the air and I caught it with my mouth. Uh, and that was, and again, that's the type of thing. She was impressed. That 80% of women, like 80% of women are going to be like, you are such a weirdo. I don't want to introduce you to my friends. Like, that's not what I'm into. But tw- but 20% are going to be, oh, I was always looking for a nerd. And you have passed, you have reached the highest nerd level. Uh, that that I think is a, is a strategy that anybody can use in dating to be, to kind of lean into an extreme version that's going to be polarizing. For that to work, though, you'd need something like a law of large numbers. You need a big database. So these dating sites would, would allow you to do that, uh, to find the 20% and weed out the 80% that are not interested in you. I'm just thinking as you were talking, I had David Buss on the podcast last year. He had a, he studies dating behavior, mating behavior, and so on. Anyway, he's talking about these massive studies on uh, these dating sites where, for example, you'll ask people, how many dates do you need to go on before you'll be intimate with somebody? And for women, it was seven. And for men, it was like, is there a number less than one? <laughs> Can we just go right, right now? <laughs> Radically massive difference. But then he got uh, contacted by some of these seduction sites that wanted to do a kind of money ball for for guys that want to just get laid as quickly as possible. The one of it, which was on your first date, take her to seven different locations so she feels like she's been on seven dates and then you'll get lucky. And so (laughs) Buss said, no, 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 I'm not letting you use my data for that. (laughs) And uh, but again, these massive, of course, he studies, you know, male, female differences in mating behavior. One uh, another one of which was um, assessments of the profiles of people you're interested in dating. So for men, they ranked if you ask them, uh, you know, what what uh, how many of these profiles would you want to go out with that you see? And it was like 96.4 percent that they see that they would go out with the person. For women, it was, I think, four and a half percent. I mean, it was just complete reverse. And so the women are a lot. Uh, so they're a lot more selective, careful, picky and so on. So the guys have to be super uh, smart, super money ball about their profiles or the, they stand no chance. Right. <laughs> so anyway, I thought that was kind of funny. Yeah, um, for sure. And. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, okay. Yeah, so, but, I think they're, they're up. So, so, so you, that, that's interesting on the dating. So, but what about love, marriage? You know, you want to go to the next step. What kind of money, how would you money ball that? Yeah. So the best study I know on that is uh, Samantha Joel and 85 scientists. I, I didn't realize this, but both studies of relationships, it seems like the most obvious question, what makes people happy in a relationship? But I think literally until a couple of years, there hasn't been a great study that's large enough to really detect patterns on the most important question any of us face. What should we look for in a long-term mate? And Samantha Joel's solution to this, there are all these studies, 30 couples, 40 couples, and they're all noisy. And uh, one person finds this, the other person, the other team finds a totally reverse thing. And Samantha Joel's smart clever idea was to join together a whole bunch of these different studies. So she recruited 85 scientists and uh, they ended up with a sample of more than 11,000 couples, more than 100 variables on every couple and uh, tried to predict using machine learning models 
uh, relationship happiness. And there are three main findings uh, from the research. Number one is that it's really, really hard to predict relationship happiness. Uh, so you, you could imagine it's, it's, it's not like predicting the weather tomorrow. It's like predicting the weather three weeks from now. Uh, like the predictive power is just much smaller than many of us might have imagined. You could imagine you knew everything about couples. There have even been this study, the John Gottman Center, where they're saying they have 90% accuracy of predicting things. And in this enormous data set, I think the most comprehensive study we've ever seen, it's really, really hard knowing everything about two human beings in a couple to predict whether they're happy in their relationship. Uh, so that's point number one. Point number two, if anything predicts it, it's your happiness outside a relationship. Uh, so the, basically being happy yourself, you're just much more likely to be happy in a relationship. It's really not them, it's much more you. If you're in a good place, just about anybody else is likely to make you happy. And if you're in a bad place, just about nobody's gonna make you happy. Uh, and number three, if there is anything that increases the odds in a partner making you happy, it's these psychological traits, things like having a growth mindset, conscientiousness, uh, satisfaction with life, secure attachment style, all these psychological, I always thought of as these stupid psychological terms that didn't mean anything, but they actually mean a ton. Uh, they, they're incredibly predictive. They are more predictive than anything else you can measure about uh, a person. Uh, Logan Yuri has a great book, How to Not Die Alone, which really dives into this as well, which everyone should read. Uh, but I, uh, so the interesting thing about this research is it's totally the opposite of how everybody dates. So the things that don't, that basically have no predictive power, uh, pretty close to zero predictive power and how happy you are, how attract in a long term, how attractive is your mate, conventionally attractive is your mate, how tall is your mate, what occupation are they in, uh, how, even how similar they are to you, that's surprisingly unpredictive of uh, long-term happiness, uh, the race, their race. So it basically suggests we're all dating totally wrong. Uh, it really comes back to Moneyball, where uh, Moneyball, one of the great insights of Moneyball was there was a major disconnect between uh, how much players cost on the open market and how much value they actually added. So there are all these players, they just said they had a hot girlfriend. So everyone said, yeah, you're awesome. Uh, we, we need to have you. You're, you look like a baseball player, but uh, they actually sucked. And there are all these players who didn't look like great baseball players, like Kevin Euclid, the example I mentioned earlier, uh, where he was kind of short for a first baseman. He was chubby. He didn't really look like a baseball player. So he wasn't valued very highly, but if you looked at his actual stats, he was valued very highly. And I think the dating market is very, very similar where people are after these traits that just don't correlate with long-term happiness. So, you know, I think uh, the data is, I'm pretty, I'm not sure I have the number exactly right, but 70% of women on Bumble want a guy 5'10 or above. So, so, so only 30% of women are willing to date a guy under 5'10. So, 70% immediately knock out 50% of the population. So 5'10 is the average size. So 70% of the women on Bumble, they, they get a filter. They immediately have knocked out 50% of the population. Well, that's just, and height doesn't correlate at all with long-term happiness in a relationship. So clearly, women should be looking more at shorter men uh, because there's a massive inefficiency and you're much more likely to find a mate who's Secure has a secure attachment style, satisfied with life, growth mindset, conscientiousness, makes you happy. Uh, if you're willing to uh, consider the 50% of the market that 70% of the women are completely eliminating. Uh, so I think uh, it's, a, it's an inefficient market. Of course, it's hard to follow that advice because people are really into people with these shiny characteristics like, uh, you know, beauty and height and cool occupation. Uh, it's hard for us to overrule that instinct. I'm sure David Buss and others would tell you that there's some evolutionary reason for our draw to some of these qualities. That, uh, that but is, to the extent you yeah, can't overrule it, yeah. yeah. 
To the extent you can overrule it or limit its power a little bit, you're going to have much more success in the dating market. I think a lot of people are perpetually single. They're trying to date the same people everybody else is trying to date. Uh, you know, if you, if, 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 if you want to date, if a heterosexual man wants to date a woman who ranks 10 out of 10 in physical attractiveness, you're going to have a tough time uh, finding her and uh, you might be single for many, many years. Uh, and even if you do find her, you may find that there's a reason that she's still single, uh, that there is, you know, despite having the most desirable characteristic, if she's single, is there something about her that uh, has, has left her single that, that is a red flag? Uh, so... Yes, because think, that, yeah. that woman on, it's, it's, on a dating site is going to get probably 100 pings a day, uh, the, the, the 10 out of 10 uh, woman. And so she has her pick. So if she was high on other traits, you'd think if the market was efficient, she'd be off the market pretty quickly. If she really wanted to settle down and she's got you know 10,000 guys a year to pick from, she'd find the one she's really looking for. So what you're saying is that maybe she's got a, maybe she's high in neuroticism on the big five or She's difficult to, to live with over a long period of time. And so really the looks uh, is just sort of the first cut, right? So, you know, Buss's argument, the argument from evolutionary psychologists is that, you know, these kind of features that we find attractive are proxies for genetic health. That's the idea. You know, sort of a, a waist to hip ratio of 0.7, uh, a symmetrical face, clear complexion, uh, you know, lustrous hair and, you know, in guys, kind of a wedge-shaped upper body, strong arms, um, you know, masculine chin. You know, you could kind of go through the list. There's some challenges to that by anthropologists that say that's not true in all cultures, although the evolutionary psychologists say there are some universals to beauty. But, of course, that's only get, getting you past the first cut. Well, then what else matters? Because a lot of other things matter, right? So, uh, I'm not 5'10". I'm not even 5'9". Okay, I'm 5'8". Okay, I'm 5'8". If I have my tennis shoes on and I'm really stretching out, it's really more like 5'7". What can I do, right? So, well, I, I found out in high school that girls also like intelligence because I'm, 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 I, it's something I never thought of in high school. I majored in base, baseball, basically. I just played sports. And that's all I cared about. And, uh, and I overheard one of them, some... One of the girls I, I, I kind of like, say, that Shermer guy is really smart. I really like that. I went, oh, girls like intelligence. Okay, maybe I'll work on that. So, uh, and isn't there some study where for each degree you have, you know, BA, MA, PhD, you, 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 you're judged to be taller by like an inch per degree or something like that. There's almost a kind of misperception based on status. Yes, yeah, definitely for men, <laughs> there's pretty good, ev for men, there's pretty good evidence that uh, degrees do help, not so much for women. Uh, although it, you know, it doesn't necessarily hurt there, there are some, there have been some claims that a woman getting a PhD or getting a master's degree is going to be really hurt on the market. I think that's not really true. Uh, but it doesn't really help women where it does help men, uh, to have, a to have additional degrees. And, uh, I think, but I think you're also kind of showing the finding a niche market, uh, strategy. Uh, this is kind of another example of that similar to my just nerd it up. Uh, so lean into, if you find that you, there's something about you that some women are, are going to like, because it's not all women, uh, a lot of women would not care that you had a lot of degrees or that you read a lot of books or knew about evolutionary biology and the history of religion and all these things. But uh, some women aren't going to be into that. And I think that's, that's a great strategy. Again, if you're not, if you're six, two, and, uh, you know, which, I, which I'm certainly not, I'm probably similar height to you if you're six two and uh gorgeous uh you don't have to necessarily do much uh you can just kind of show up mm -hmm. yeah. uh, but if you aren't then you have to do other things i think the other thing with dating uh the other piece of advice is it really is a numbers game so uh they've done studies on what happens when some of the least desirable people on the site measured in different ways, ask out, uh, send a message to some of the most desirable people on the site. And uh, I, I thought, I thought before looking at this, what's the response rate? I'm thinking one in a billion, <laughs> like this just doesn't happen. This doesn't happen on planet earth <laughs> that someone at the bottom of the market reaches out to someone at the top of the market and gets even a response. 
And it seems to be more like 14% for men and 35% for women. And you can do the math. It's kind of a simple calculation. If you ask, if you have a 14% chance of something and you try 30 times, you have a 98% chance now. <laughs> uh, you know, it's just a simple mathematical, right. uh, greater than 98% chance. It's sim- simple math at that point uh, to calculate that. So I think people who aren't, again, uh, who, who aren't, if you're the top of the market, you just sit there, do nothing, and the world just <laughs> comes to you. Mm-hmm. And you don't have to do it. You don't have to have... You don't have to get a degree. You don't have to uh, ask a ton of people out. You just can kind of sift through your suitors. Uh, but if you're not there in the top of the market, you have to both lean into an extreme version of yourself and then ask a ton of people out, uh, which that was my big mistake in my 20s uh, was I just never, I was so shy and so scared of rejection that I just like never asked woman out very rarely and and if i did i did in this very awkward way that allowed for plausible deniability (laughs) uh (laughs) oh you thought i was asking you out no no i was just joking (laughs) yeah no i wasn't no i was just saying i was no 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 of course not i'm not really into you Uh, (laughs) that's really uh you know to kind of soften the blow and uh you know and that's a disaster uh so if you can i think any man or woman a woman too. I think playing hard to get as a woman is the worst advice I've ever heard. Uh, if you want to, I think it's an advice that appeals to heterosexual women's, uh, to every human being's desire to not put themselves out there in the dating market. And it, it's nice to think that, oh yeah, I, I could just sit back or if I, if I ask, you know, ask myself, ask someone out, uh, I'm going to, you know, ruin the chances or come off as too aggressive. But there have been studies that the biggest way a woman, a heterosexual woman, increase their odds of getting a desirable date is just sending messages to men. Uh, so both for men and women, these two strategies of uh, being an extreme version of yourself, leaning into a niche and asking lots of people out uh, is successful. And then, but I mean, the main thing is with is is not is trying to care less about these superficial traits that aren't going to make you happy anyway because they're so heavily competed yeah. over. Remember that e- economist joke where the two economists are walking down the sidewalk and one of them sees a hundred dollar bill and he goes, "Look, a hundred dollar bill." And the other one goes, "Can't be because somebody would have picked it up already." <laughs> so you never know. Maybe you're the yeah. first one or you're the the right one that she picks or whatever. You never know. Um, yeah, well, so um, you can compensate because, you know, the evolutionary psychologists also talk about other traits like creativity, humor, intelligence, being an artist, a poet, uh, you know, the, the, the well-known rock star, you know, that it doesn't matter what they look like. Some of these rockers are just not particularly traditionally good looking, right? But there's, so there's other things or the, you know, aphrodisiac of power, you know, applied to Henry Kissinger. You know, so there's obviously clearly other characteristics that people care about after that first cut, say, of being 5'10", if you're a guy, you know, and and, uh, so, you know, what can a politician do, right? Because you have those studies showing the taller politicians are more likely to get elected, politicians with certain faces that convey, uh, what, dominance and confidence and... and, and Confidence, 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 yeah. yeah. You know, so what if you you know, don't have those characteristics, but you have a a good political platform you want to sell. And if you get elected, you can make a difference. So, you know, what can people do to, to, to sort of adjust on these other characteristics? Well, my, my uh, idea for adjusting, I'm not looking the part in politics was to get data analysis to improve your appearance, <laughs> uh, which oh. I talk about in the book. And I actually <laughs> did, uh, where I did a study of myself, I took, right. I created face app is an artificial intelligence. You can create hundred more than a hundred versions of yourself. And so it's me with a beard, without a beard, mustache, no mustache, goatee, no goatee, uh, brown hair, gray hair, pink hair, glasses, no glasses, different types of glasses. And then I just asked people to rank, uh, how confident I looked. And it turned out there were only two things that changed how confident I looked, but they were big boosts is one I a beard and two uh glasses mm. oh. uh, which i would that 
those are my two looks. I, now I do wear glasses and a beard. Now I don't have glasses now because I'm nearsighted and I wouldn't be able to, like I, I, it would mess up my, uh, my vision for this podcast. But, uh, if, if I had glasses, believe me, I'd look more competent. And now I do when I go give talks or whatever, I have my glasses because the data suggests I look more competent and I have my beard now all the time. I used to go back and forth, beard, no beard. Now I have my beard all the time. Uh, and so, uh, I think it's kind of one of the nice things you said, men, uh, they get judged on things like, you know, how their chin looks, their mouth. The nice thing about beards is men kind of hide some of their imperfections. So I think I had some imperfections in my face that the beard is <laughs> able to hide a little bit, that that's what the data analysis was telling me. But, uh, I think, you know, of course I'm not going to be, uh, Mitt Romney or, uh, Barack Obama I don't think anybody's going to look at me and be like, this is the man who should lead our nation. <laughs> uh, so I think if you want to be president, you put, if you want to be president and you don't uh, look like a president, you just should try not to be president. That would be my advice. <laughs> find, find uh, something else it, to it's do. similar to being an actor and actress. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it's, it's similar to being an actor and actress. Like there are definitely, you know, actors and actresses who aren't gorgeous uh you know like i guess dustin hoffman is an example of someone who wasn't considered like movie star conventional movie star gorgeous but had a great career and danny devito even a more extreme example of that but these are the exceptions uh pretty much every movie star you know if you looked at a i haven't seen this but if you looked at a the probability of being a movie star compared to how conventionally attractive you are, it would look, I mean, the chart would be, it would be off the charts. So if you don't, if you're not a 10 out of 10 in movie star, good looks, just don't try to be a movie star. Uh, uh, it's not the best. It's just too low a probability event. I would say uh, that would be my advice to aspiring politicians who don't look like Mitt Romney is uh, try to be Mitt Romney's speechwriter, maybe. Uh, <laughs> uh, you might have a better chance of that. Since you're a sports fan, wouldn't that uh, also apply to kids and teenagers who want to be professional athletes? And, you know, many are called, few are chosen. How, how would you advise somebody like that? I want to be in the NBA. Yeah, everybody wants to be in the NBA, but you know, you're not tall enough, yeah. you're not good whatever. I, I would, and uh, <laughs> there's this movie where... Uh, uh, Happiness with Will Smith. I don't oh. know if you've seen it. Yeah. And uh, I did. I saw that. Will Smith's son is practicing basketball. And uh, Will Smith basically uh, tells him, you're wasting your time. Uh, basketball is very genetic. You're, you're going to probably be like me and just not be a great basketball player. You know, I wasn't a great, I want to be a great basketball player. I wasn't a great basketball player. I'd try something else. And the kid's really dejected. He's really hurt. And uh, Will Smith rethinks it. And he gives him an, another talk. And he says, you know, son, you can do whatever you want. If you dream for something, go for it. Go for it. You can be a basketball player. And I think it's just horrible advice. His first <laughs> advice was much better. Uh, you have no shot. Uh, rather than uh, you can do it. Because basketball is heavily reliant on genetics. And heavily reliant, particularly on height, uh, where there's each inch of additional height just about doubles your chances of making the NBA. And someone under six foot tall would have about a one in 1.2 million chance of reaching the NBA. And someone over seven foot tall would have a one in seven chance of reaching the NBA. So if you're under, if you're under six foot tall, if your if your parents are, you know, if your parents are 5'10 and 5'5 five five, uh, average and they weren't basketball players themselves. Yeah, they, you're not going to be, a, I hate to say it, you're just not going to be a professional basketball player. It's not going to happen. Uh, it's, it's, uh, but there are some sports. I, I talk about equestrianism, fencing. There are some sports that seem to have uh, diving that seem to be more egalitarian. Uh, so if you're really into sports, as I was in a kid, as a kid, there may be some sports where you have more of a shot. Uh, but you know, yeah, if you if you're not genetically gifted, 
uh, basketball, track and field, uh, some of these sports, you got no shot. Yeah. Uh, which sounds cold. And <laughs> another reason, along with my appearance, I could never be president. Uh, <laughs> or in the I don't NBA. I people uh, <laughs> love hearing this. Yeah, I could. Yeah, but, uh, you know, you're supposed to say kids should follow their dreams and whatever you want to do, you can do it. But uh, the NBA is a dream that's reserved for people who have extraordinary uh, genetic gifts, including height. Yeah, so there, I think, finding a sport or a profession, if you want to widen the conversation, where there's not as deep a talent pool, not as many people are doing it. There's not as much money to make that talent pool even deeper. Remember when I, uh, let's see, this would have been uh, mid mid to late 70s, I, I was playing a lot of tennis, this was sort of in the McEnroe, Connors, Bjorn Borg era where tennis got really popular. So I started playing some tournaments and the, the, the talent pool was pretty deep and I wasn't climbing the ladder very well. And then I discovered cycling in 1980. And so I took up bike racing and, and bike racing, cycling in America was just nothing. Nobody was doing it. No one cared about it. I really loved the sport. And then, so I got good at that. I thought, oh, this is interesting. Find a sport that no one else is doing or almost no one else is doing. You can have a, you know, just more opportunity uh, to carve a niche. And I would say that must be true for most professions, right? If you say, well, now I want to be a pioneering Bill Gates or a Sergey Brin kind of Google programmer. programmer. Well, good luck with that. I mean, there's a million of them now, right? Um, so, you know, timing is is everything on these things. You know, it's said that had been Bill Gates been born 10 years earlier or later, same thing with the Google Boys, had they been born 10 years earlier or later, they would have missed that whole um, revolution that they started. So timing is important as well for the larger context of the economic environment in which you step. For sure, and I totally agree with avoiding what everybody wants to do. So there's this study by statisti two statisticians of what businesses go out of business the quickest, basically the worst businesses in the United States. And the single worst business was a record store <laughs> because everybody wants to start a record store. Like, <laughs> you know, you, there've been movies, there've been at least two, I think, movies featuring people who started a record store. They won't watch those movies. Like I want to start a record store and everybody's trying to do it. And you're just going to go out of business fast. And the other businesses that folded very, very quickly included uh, toy stores, clothing stores, beauty supply stores, all these things that are kind of stuff of childhood dreams uh, or movies. It's a terrible way to live your career, to try to follow things you see in the movies because everybody else is going to be trying to follow that as well. Mm -hmm. Right. So let's shift to your chapter on, on money. Um, so that was quite surprising, the, the different professions that uh, generate the most money. Who are the millionaires? They're not who you think they are. Yes, that's a study, uh, Capitalist in the 21st Century, by uh, Matthew Smith, uh, Danny Yagan, uh, Owen Sidar, and Eric Zwick. And uh, they studied the entire universe of American taxpayers. They studied who's may entering the top 0.1%. Uh, and... They, 0.1% is make people make over $1.58 million per year. So that's a lot of money. It's, it's very rich. And, uh, they, they had the sense of paper that kind of was pretty surprising to me that the typical rich American is the owner of a regional business, such as an auto dealership or beverage distributor. And again, that's just not. Certainly, there aren't many movies. I think some people have pointed out there have been a couple movies featuring a rich auto dealer owner, uh, but not as many other as there have been movies of a powerful CEO or uh, you know celebrities or tech people. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty. Uh, it was pretty surprising to me. And if you kind of look at the fields that make people rich. I think one of the things that tends to happen is uh, they have local monopolies of some sort. So auto dealership is a classic example of this, where I talked to some professors, I was researching this, I'm like, why are auto dealer owners so rich? And the professors are just furious at auto dealerships. They're, these are local, these are monopolies, they're screwing consumers, uh, which I'm sure there's some truth to. I, I That wasn't, my book's not a political book, so it wasn't a treatise on 
uh, legal changes that should be made. I was just kind of curious. Uh, and, and it's a self-help book. So if anything, I'm kind of like, you need to have a local monopoly if you want to get rich. <laughs> right. Uh, rather than these are the policy implications, though I'm sure other people would go in that direction. Uh, but uh, auto dealerships have protections that they, they there are laws that allow that allow dealerships to service a particular uh, cars company in one region. It's very difficult to fire them. So the, the danger with business, so business is the way to get rich. The way to get rich is owning a business. But the problem is most businesses, you don't get rich because you're stuck in ruthless price competition. And, you know, if you study economics, the first thing you learn in economics is the zero profit condition, which is uh, profit. If, if you're making profit in a, in a field, someone else is going to come in and charge less and take away all your profit. So you have to find some way to avoid that uh and auto dealerships beverage distribu distribution companies some other fields uh have this way of uh kind of uh allow allowing your uh, uh allowing yourself to keep some profits and not just have someone uh come in and undercut you you i mean uh you don't have to have legal protection you can just have for example a local monopoly could be uh, based on your connections to a region, if you uh, or really deep expertise that you have that nobody else has. Uh, so market research seems to have this phenomenon I talk about uh, where you learn over many years something very specific about a field and you meet all these people in this field and then you sell your reports uh, for some large amount of money. And uh, I think that's there, but but it, it does show it's really, really hard to get rich. You got to own a business and you have to have some way to avoid price competition, which even people who know the first part, they don't totally understand the second part. So you see all these people trying to start, uh, you know, uh, like a pest control business or something because I'll own the business, then I'll uh, get rich. But no, you won't because a pest control business is basically completely commodified and... Uh, you just, any profits will be eliminated by spending on Google ads, trying to get higher on the results because everybody's just looking for any pest control person. They don't care. So, uh, no, I think, I think getting rich is, I, I kind of took from that chapter, getting rich is harder than mm. I wished it were. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> it's, let, it's, I'm going to come back to that in a second about how important that is or not. But to clarify, so if I want to open a Ford dealership, I got to go to Ford and they're going to go, oh, no, no, there's already somebody in Santa Barbara. So you, you'd have to go somewhere where there isn't a Ford dealership because they control that, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that would yeah. also explain why, like here in Santa Barbara, all the automobile dealerships are in the same square mile. They're like all on the same road right next to each other. Right. So there must be some other economic force like servicing different car companies. Yeah, servicing different car companies. Right. But Including, you never see Toyota dealer here and another Toyota dealer right there, right next right. to it. And they're both competing over Unlike price, Starbucks, which you do see in other fields. So gas stations, gas stations, for example, which is mu it's much harder to get rich in. Mm. Uh, you see the gas stations all locate in the same place, but they're all competing with each other. Uh, and they're all always forced to lower their prices if one person is charging even a little bit more, everyone's going to go to the one who's charging a little bit less. Right, right. Yeah, like the guy I bought this house from, I'm sitting in here in Santa Barbara, he was a bottler. Uh, he's still a bottler, I guess. And I, I remember thinking, oh, how boring is that? Then I find out he, he makes like 10 times the amount of money I make. I'm like, oh, okay. I guess that bottling thing does pay off pretty well. Who knew? I didn't know that. <laughs> right. So... But okay, uh, so you also talk yeah. about you also talk about that paradox where allegedly uh, there's some upper limit to how much you can make, and, and above that it doesn't really make people any happier. But that was also debunked, right? So talk about that a little bit. Money and happiness. Yeah, it's not true. Uh, so there used to be an idea: once you reach seventy five thousand dollars, any income above that doesn't uh, increase your happiness. But it's it's not true, and uh, I think. Uh, it, but, but one thing that is true is that there are diminishing returns to money. So the, the study is Matthew Killingsworth 
and he found that each you have to keep doubling your income to get the same uh, benefit. So uh, it's not that you hit a point seventy five thousand dollars and that's just completely flat, but the curve does look like this, where it's getting harder and harder to uh, earn more to earn it, to get happiness through increased income. Though there is some evidence. There's a recent study that they've studied uh, thousands of millionaires. And they found there's a boost in happiness when you make more than eight million dollars a year. <laughs> no, okay. Uh, which, yeah, no, 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 no. Sorry, more than a net worth of more than eight million dollars. I, I see. If you have a net worth of more than eight yeah. million dollars, yeah, uh, you get an additional boost to happiness. Yeah. So let me. Uh, I think part of the reason. For let, that, let, let, let's talk about that for a minute, because I think uh, happiness is the wrong metric. It's one metric. It's good to be happy. It's better to be happy than depressed and anxious and sad and whatever. Okay. But r really, is that the goal of money? Or to me, the value of making more and more money is that you don't have to think about making money as much. I mean, poor people have to think about money all the time. You know, if you're right on the knife edge and you don't know, know, know if you're going to make your, your bills that month, that, that is a huge burden to carry and it's not that making money makes me happier. It's that it doesn't. It takes away that stress and that anxiety and that concern, and just scale that up, right? It just it provides more opportunities. There's just more things you could do. Maybe give to charities, or start a company, or start a nonprofit, or you know, even something simple like flying uh, business class rather than uh, a coach if it's like a six-hour flight or more, which is what I try to do. Simply. Not that it makes me happy. It's just that I'm 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 not as unhappy as I would be if I'm stuck in coach for twelve hours flying to Europe or something like that. And uh, so it's not happiness so much. It's that it just makes life easier, right? It buys maybe slightly better education for your kids, slightly better food, and 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 that just leads to a higher quality life that that isn't burdened by impoverishment or anxiety about money. I'm not sure that's happiness, right? So, and then let's talk about that for a minute. Like uh, I wrote about the difference between happiness and meaningfulness or purposefulness um, in the uh, Heavens on Earth. I was reading Roy Baumeister's research on this, a psychologist, that, you know, happiness is more of a short-term thing. Like you go out for dinner with your friends. That's fun. I feel happy when I'm having drinks and dinner with my friends. Uh, and the next day that's gone, right? I don't, I'm not happy anymore. It's like, well, that was fun last night. What am I going to do tonight, right? So, but a short-term. And it's also more self-focused. You know, how do I feel uh, about me and what are people, how are people treating me? So that affects happiness. But Bob Meister's point is that if you want to lead a meaningful, purposeful life, it has to be more long-term, forward and back, you know, kind of having, here's my past, here's my goals, this is where I want to get to, here's how far I've come, and then more other-oriented, right? So the analogy I make is, you know, caretaking for my parents. I did for two of my four parents. I was at step parents. And, uh, you know, this wasn't fun. It didn't make me happy driving my poor dad around to all these doctors. It was tiring. Uh, it, you know, but I felt like I'm a better person for it. You know, I, I, ha I have a more meaningful life that I did this thing for my parents. And I would want my kids to do that for me. And that just makes life richer, right? Not happy, but, but just m more purposeful, more meaningful. And so things like having a reason to get up and out of the house in the morning to go off to do something purpose, you know, meaningful work is one of these things that leads not, not necessarily happiness, but, but more purposefulness, right? Having a, a love relationship, a marriage or a significant other you know, intimate partner. Uh, and then, you know, belonging to some, it doesn't have to be religion, but some spiritual like, uh, kind of awe and wonder in your universe could be meditation, could be, you know, some, uh, program you belong to, but, but religion also fulfills that because it takes you out of yourself and puts you somewhere else. Like other people matter. And I'm going to feel like I've had a better life if I do something to help other people. And in the long run, I want to make the world a better place and all that, you know, so, um, that, that, that was my only objection that, uh, about the, the stuff on money and, and happiness. I love the mappiness project. That's great. But that's not the only metric is my point. There's other things we should be measuring and considering that are also equally important, if not more so. So I'm kind of a weirdo in that I studied philosophy and I was just a complete utilitarian in that just maximize the pleasure and pain 
in over the course of a human, uh, but but uh, uh, of the course of our existence. And you know, there's always is it better to be uh, Socrates unsatisfied than a pig satisfied? And I'm always like, go with the pig, uh, <laughs> which is not what most people think. No, <laughs> that's funny. From that uh, analysis, but just other people matter so whether caring for your dad uh, may have lowered your happiness but it increased his happiness so that's something i didn't get into in happiness if you just lie in a beach having sex when people need you uh that would not be a good way to live your life uh i'm a little less into the i i kind of am a hedonist uh, i I can't, I don't know, I, I don't know how to argue it. I don't know. It's one of, the, one of the frustrating things about philosophy is you just kind of come to something and then you don't really know. There's no way to convince. If you're a utilitarian, someone else has a different value system. How do you convince the other person? I don't really know if there's a way. But I am more a hedonist. Like philosophically, I'm more a hedonist than other people. So, uh, but I, I take your point and I don't think, yeah, you know, I just think we should keep in mind the types of things that make all of us could use a lesson in understanding more the types of things that make people happy. Even if we're trying to live a purposeful life, there are some things we're doing. So uh, if I'm scrolling through social media and feeling crappy about my life, or I'm uh, instead of uh, going on a hike with my friends, that's bad from a happiness perspective. And it's also probably bad from a purpose perspective and bad from a generosity perspective. So it's bad from most perspectives there. When the, when we're, when the data shows that there are huge inefficiencies, you can just find things that improve every metric basically. Uh, so, so taking a, 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 you know, spending more time, uh, in nature with your friends, instead of lying on the couch watching Netflix, uh, I think would win on just about any metric of value system someone could come up with. It's hard for me to think of a value system, uh, utilitarianism, more purpose-driven life, some life about more connecting with other people where that where the lying on the couch watching Netflix uh, wins. <laughs> yeah, so again, it does come down to what your larger goal is, right? So Seth, if you were 6'5", and you had the talent of Kobe Bryant, but your dad said, uh, by the way, you're going to have to practice at this like 50, 60 hours a week for the next 10 years before, you know, you're going to get into starting junior high, high school, college, and then maybe you get drafted in the NBA. And so are you telling me you'd go, mm, yeah, no, I, I, I'm a huge sports fan. I'd love to be in the NBA, but I don't want to work 60 hours a week at it. <laughs> I it's that's taking yeah that's that's uh, you're totally right i don't think anybody should read or would read my book and say i'm gonna literally do only the things that the activities that make people happiest or i'm gonna move to raise my kids in the places that that give that give kids the biggest income boost or uh i, I i'm gonna convince my kid to be a fencer because that's they better be a fencer because that gives the high one of the highest odds of getting a scholarship. It's more just this information it has is useful. It's just useful information that can help you make decisions. Uh, in that, uh, you know, if it's close, uh, tie goes to the data, mm. uh, or right. or just or it'll just give you uh, more information. So, for example, you know, if you're uh, fifty years old. And you think, you know, I've been watching all these movies and reading all these magazines of what it takes to be a successful entrepreneur. You have to be in your 20s. I have this business idea in this field I've been mastering for 20 years, but it's way too late. I missed my mark. Well, it's good to know the data that actually the odds of creating a successful business increase until the age of 60. So if you look at that chart and you say, I'm going to start a business at the age of 59 because that's the exact highest point of where a business of when a, of the odds of success that is taking this advice way too literally. 
Uh, of course, there's a lot else that goes into the equation. Is it the right time? Do you have the proper expertise? Uh, but if you use that chart and say, um, even though I've hit middle age, I have a good idea and have a lot of relevant experience, I'm going to try to start a business now. That would be a great use of the data. So th that's what I'm encouraging people not to literally just outsource all decisions to data, but to make more data informed decisions and have a better idea of how the world works uh, as they're facing these big decisions. Yeah. Uh, which, well, parents, you know, instead parents of do, parents do do that, like, you know, moving to a neighborhood where it's safer, there's less crime, the schools are better. And so on. people do that all the time. And in fact, it's kind of created this zip code inequality in public schools because there's a feedback loop there where the, you know, the higher property taxes uh, that generate more income for the schools, uh, you know, lead more parents to move there, which drives the housing prices up. So the, 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 the houses cost more. So the property tax generates more income for the schools and so on. So, um, you know, people kind of do that. But the question, so here's the question on parent, your chapter on parenting, which I also loved because I'm a parent. Um, you know, what's the goal here? And if your goal is like, if I want to get my kid into Harvard and make sure he makes $200,000 a year. He's a white collar worker, lawyer, doctor, whatever, you know, so that, you know, the, the funny, you know, Jewish grandmother story, you know, mother story, you know, my son, the doctor and, you know, and, uh, Alan Dershowitz has a funny line about that where he was a kid, he came home and he said, he told his mom, you know, the Dodgers won, the Dodgers won the World Series. And she said, yes, but is it good for the Jews? <laughs> right. So, um, you know, what is the goal of doing these things for your kid? And, and you know, I worry that a lot, some of this data driven stuff would redirect the goal to like, well, in 20 years from now, this is what I'm hoping to get my kid to, which is fine. That's good. But but don't forget about tomorrow. You know, one reason to like love your kid and read stories to them and be nice to them and feed them well and give them lots of hugs is because it's a good thing to do right now, today. It makes a better life for my kid today. And that should be good enough. I mean, that's that's a good goal. I mean, I hope nobody reads my book and says, I'm, now I'm not going to hug my kid today <laughs> yeah. uh, based on this data analysis. I think <laughs> right. the data is certainly consistent with uh, hugging your kid and yes, loving course. your kid and being nice to your kid and and taking them on cool vacate cool trips and going camping with your kid and bonding with them and uh, so certainly I I don't uh, I don't disagree with that with any of that uh, I I just do think that you know one of the points I make in the book is that adult role models have more of a of a impact in how they turn out than we sometimes suspect and one of the things you can do is as far as nudging your kid to be a good person or to be uh, have a cool career, you can sometimes introduce them to other people because kids have complicated relationships with their parents. Sometimes kids think their parents are the coolest person in the world. Sometimes they think their uh, parents are the dumbest people in the world. Uh, but their friends or their neighbors, they think they, they pretty much universally think they're cool. And there have been these studies that if little girls move to areas with lots of female scientists, they're more likely to become scientists themselves. And I think things like, you know, parents, I think maybe don't fully consider the extent to which the other people they're exposing their kids to can be influencing them. Uh, but <laughs> that doesn't, certainly nothing I said suggests, I don't disagree with anything you said, hugging your kid, that uh, the, the uh, loving your kid, uh, appreciating your kid, uh, supporting your kid, whether or not they turn out to be a scientist. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> or I'm, I'm certainly not arguing against that. Yeah, no, of course. And I didn't, I didn't get that from your book, but it, it did trigger that memory of Judith Rich Harris's book, The Nurture Assumption that came out in the late nineties. And there was, but basically she was saying, you know, if you look at behavior genetics and, you know, and the, the whole a suite of influences on, children from parents parents have a lot less influence than you think that they have you know so there's only so much you could do because a lot of it's genetic you know you just inherit from uh, your parents and their parents and so on your you know 
characteristics of the big five personality, not to mention intelligence and looks and all that stuff. There's only so much you could do in your home environment. And I remember when that book came out, uh, my, my daughter was in grammar school and then middle school when all that was being discussed. And she had a friend whose mother, Asian friend, and Asian mother, who was just obsessed with getting her daughter into Harvard or, you know, it has to be one of the big, you know, Ivy League schools or, you know, or else I'm a failed parent. She didn't quite say it that way, but you could tell this was really important. And it's like, man, that's just too much emphasis. You know, yeah, of course, I hope I get my, my daughter gets into a good school if that's what she wants. But, you know, but if she doesn't get in, so what? You know, I know lots of people that lead totally happy, successful, fulfilled lives that never went to college. So let's not make that as the metric, right? And same thing with money. You don't have to make that much money uh, and and to lead a, you know, kind of a simple, fulfilling life. Anyway, that's, I think, again, it's that trade-off thing. You know, what's your I, goal? I don't disagree. I'm, we're on the same page. Yeah. We're on the same page. I just thought the data is interesting on, you know, how much parents matter, how much neighborhoods matter, which neighborhoods seem to increase kids' uh, outcomes in various dimensions more. But, yeah, I'm, I'm not. Yeah. If Remind I had kids, I yeah. would. So, yeah. If I had kids, I would put Are you gonna a big do that? emphasis on them being happy. and. Yeah, give us an update. What's the uh, status with your girlfriend? Are you going to get married and have kids? What's what's the, give us the scoop. <laughs> not, no, not, not too in soon. A, in a, too in soon a to huge, tell. <laughs> huge rush. Okay, yeah. So you know, it, yeah, it there's should, no. It probably I, shouldn't be based on our ages. I but, wouldn't uh, worry about we're it. Not, that's not on the very soon rush. I was an old father the what? first time. I was 37 years old when my daughter was born. And then I was 60 when my son was born. So how's that? You, you oh, have plenty of time. Wow. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right yeah, i guess men do tend to yeah to have more time yeah 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 no i love all this stuff i mean life should be data driven to a certain extent so let's kind of wrap up by talking about dataism as the new religion you quote uh yuval noah harari algorithms know us better than we know ourselves how far do you think the kind of the money balling of life can go should go uh, we're just getting started, right? So, um, you know, to what extent should we apply it, not just to ourselves, but political systems, economic systems, you know, the whole, uh, you know, libertarian paternalism of Dick Thaler, you know, nudging people to, to do this or that, and that as a society, you know, the governments can do certain things. You know, we can give tax breaks for being married, for homing, owning a home, for having children, you know, we can nudge people to give to charities by giving them a tax break. We can nudge people to tick the little box on their driver's license that you will donate your organs uh, uh, unless you put punch the um, the button on the. That's what we have in in California opt out system. So there are things you could do that are data driven. We know people are terrible about investments in retirement accounts, right? So you know, corporations are going to do that for you because the data shows that I don't know what like sixty percent of Americans have zero money saved when they retire, right? So knowing that, how far do you want, would you want to go with the government having a program of you know, this kind of data-driven policy? I think they're open questions. As you said, we're so early into this um, data explosion that we don't know how it's going to play out. I, I talk about uh, Yuval Harari, and he says that when you decide who to get married in the future, it's just going to be an algorithm that tells you being with this person will make you happy, and that's the end of it. And then I transferred to this study by Samantha Joel and 85 uh, co-authors, where they say it's basic, it's nearly impossible to predict whether two people are happy in a relationship with data. So uh, it's not just the world. Sometimes we're dealing with chaotic systems, and uh, to just think you can have a computer telling you at any point uh, what to do, I think you know I'm, I'm probably more skeptical of that than. Harari is. Uh, but I do think definitely we're getting to a stage where we can have more a money ball approach to life, where the data doesn't make every decision for us, but we're more data informed uh, about all these co topics, you know, who's, who's actually rich, what's the age, best age to start a business, uh, how can I look better, what actually makes people happy, what predicts, what's at least somewhat predictive or romantic happiness, how can I be more attractive in dating, uh, what really matters in parenting and what doesn't for various outcomes. So I think we're moving towards much more evidence 
you know, it's similar to baseball in many ways where it's not because just because you have the data, the data tells you exactly how good every player is going to be. There's still tremendous uncertainty. It just can nudge you and say, okay, I, that player, those players have a better shot than I would have guessed. So I'll draft them. Uh, and I think it's going to be similar that it's not like a, you're just going to click on your phone and say, do this right now because that's going to maximize your happiness. But you will have be able to consult data that tells you, okay, you probably should spend more time in nature. You probably should spend more time with your friends. You probably should spend more time hiking uh, and, may, and, you know, and, and, and less time lying on your couch watching uh, Netflix or playing computer games because uh, that's not re- that doesn't really make people happy. So so it's 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 a data driven. Uh, just I think data is going to be more more a factor in how we make bigger decisions. Much more a factor in how we make bigger decisions. Even if we're not just going to become as Harari seems to imply. Uh, like slaves to algorithms that just tell us what to do at every particular moment. I think we're more going to consult the data uh, to face these as we face these big decisions. Yeah, yeah, I, I like the uh, oh, and Cass Sunstein too, also on the uh, libertarian paternalism or the nudge, where you you don't have to do anything; you can do whatever you want. But here's what the data shows that you know that the these yeah. investment programs right. with the company are more risk averse. If you're more risk averse, you should get these and those pick whatever you want, but that's what the data shows. And I think I, I like that, you know, Sunstein makes the point you, you, we're, we're making choices one way or the other anyway, why not do it in a rational way with data rather than your gut? Yeah. Why not have that information available? It seems like it can only be a good thing to know if you're deciding whether to marry someone or whether to date someone, shouldn't you know what 11,000 couple, shouldn't you learn from 11,000 other couples? like the patterns in their marriages, why would you not want that information? Right. It seems clearly relevant. Uh, oh, by the way, on the Gutman yeah. claim that of a 90% prediction, wasn't that for who was going to get divorced, not who was going to be happily married? Yeah, I think so, but I'm still, I'm anything, I'm skeptical at 90%. Yeah, like, of anything in human behavior. So I'm, I'm a social scientist. Yeah. I've never seen 90%. Never. Nothing is ninety percent predictable. Anything though. in social, <laughs> right? Yeah, you, you. I mean, you put a graph on a social of a social science finding. It usually looks like a Jackson Pollock painting. <laughs> like all the points are all over the place. Right. There's never, a, you know, a straight line of everything's exactly what right. it's supposed to be. So, right. I mean, I'm not saying Gottman doesn't do great work and hasn't found some some neat things, but ninety percent. Yeah, unlikely. Uh, no way. I just remember the stories about filming couples that were unhappy, so they're in marriage counseling, and that when they're rolling their eyes and and kind of giving uh, body language that they're disgusted. It was disgust was the predictor. You know, if you don't respect and you just dis- and you're disgusted by your partner, you you have a ninety percent chance of this marriage breaking up, something like that. Maybe it's the Anna Kar- Karenina principle, right? All happy families are happy in the same way, and unhappy families are all unhappy in their own unique way. You know, it could be something like that, but I don't know. Yeah, well, I'll just say the social science principle, nothing's uh, lower than 30% or <laughs> right. higher than 70%. Right. <laughs> so when I see 90%, yeah. I immediately say, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I don't believe it. <laughs> All right, Seth, that, that that's a good place to end it. What's your uh, next project? What are you researching and writing about next? I don't know. I mean, I say this, it's completely honest. I put everything I got into this mm. book. It's a great book. Uh, so I loved this it. book. Was yeah. Every, thank you. But every topic I was interested in, like I didn't do physical health because I just it's not a passion of mine. I would have gotten bored. And I think people <laughs> would have sensed that, so it wouldn't have been a mm. good fit. But I was really interested in happiness. I did, you know, I I said what what I thought the best research said on that. I was really interested in entrepreneurship, luck, appearance, uh, dating and marriage, parenting. So I don't know. I'm kind of sports. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll just go more into sports because uh, <laughs> uh, I seem to never get bored of that. But I'm, I don't have an obvious next. Move, oh, that's so. what I was going to ask you. We'll if see. everybody does Moneyball, then the Moneyball effect disappears, right? There's actually was a study that, uh, yeah, the you know Moneyball said that people who walked a lot were undervalued, right? And 
if you actually look at the data, the people who walked a lot were undervalued and then Moneyball comes and comes around and then immediately they were overvalued. <laughs> right. So walk went from undervalued before Moneyball to overvalued because everyone just said, oh, walk, people walk a lot. Let's pay them more money without mm. really thinking through exactly how much they were worth. Mm. Uh, so yeah, there could be some of that phenomenon. <laughs> That's uh, right in some of these areas uh i mean i think some of the some of them aren't zero sum so happiness for example uh isn't zero sum where uh if you spend more time taking walks by a lake you're not really blocking other people from doing the same but if you move into one of the areas that are good for raising kids then yeah that is one less slot uh in the that area in, in those areas for someone else. So it is there, those are more zero sum and you may be more that those may be more subject to reversals based on when people find out about the data. Right. Right. Well, that's a good place to end it again. Here's the book. So, Don't trust your gut using data to get what you really want in life. I learned a lot from it. Thanks, Seth. Thanks for your work. And thanks for that book. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me.